Amen. Praise God, it is good. Hallelujah. And uh, go to Psalm chapter number 22. We're returning to our series in the book of Psalms. I'm preaching through the Psalms. Psalm chapter number 22. We'll be starting off in this chapter and verse number one. And verse number one, and that's the only verse we're going to read tonight. We're not going to get any further than verse number one. I know there's 31 verses, and so... Um, it, it might be, amen, hallelujah. I, I'll try not to, but uh, I've been in this, I think we started this, what, two years ago? And so anyway, Psalm chapter number 21, or Psalm chapter number 22, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter number 22, look at verse number one with me. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace, Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for bringing my kids in today. And Lord, I just thank you so much for family. I do thank you for children that have honored me and Mrs. Frost. And Lord, I just thank you for their lives their love for you, their service to you. And Lord, I just thank you so much for, for my grandchildren. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd fill me, use me, guide, direct me as I preach your word. I pray you bless now uh, the preaching of Psalm chapter number 22, verse number 1. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, the power of his blood we plead. Amen. It is good to be born again. And so in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed as the shepherd of his sheep. And so, and as we look at that, actually three different times in the New Testament, there are three different pronouns used in this matter of the good shepherd or the shepherd. And we're going to look at those. If you turn over to John chapter number 10 with me, John chapter number 10, and I'm going somewhere with this, uh, the shepherd of the sheep and John chapter number 10, I want you to see this. There's just some neat information as we get into John, uh, uh, Psalm chapter number 22, and uh, we see three different titles to uh, the shepherd, Jesus Christ. In John chapter number 10, I want you to see the first one here. And then we'll look at the other two as well. John chapter number 10, look at verse number 11. The Bible says in verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. So we see that pronoun there that describes what kind of a shepherd he is. And it says here, the good shepherd. Uh, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth a wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. You know, there's too many times, and I just had this thought come to my mind, there's too many times when, when a wolf comes into a church and begins to devour the church, the church starts having major problems, people leave the church, and instead of the shepherd staying, they go and find what they would think to be greener pastures. And that ought not be the case, amen? God called you to a place, you ought to stay there until God calls you away from that place, amen? And so, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth a wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Who's speaking here? Jesus. And know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the what? Sheep. And so we see the first title given, the good shepherd. Go to Hebrews chapter number 13 with me. Hebrews chapter number 13. I'm pretty sure in the 12 and a half years I've preached here, I don't think I've ever taught this or preach this matter of the three titles of the shepherd. Hebrews chapter number 13 with me, if you would please. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 13, and we're going to be looking at verse uh, number 20, verse number 20. Verse number 20, if you're there, say amen. amen. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that what? 
great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Now, as we see there, we see the great shepherd. We see the good shepherd, the great shepherd. Now go over to 1 Peter chapter number 5 with me. 1 Peter chapter number 5. And here we see another title given to the shepherd. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Look at verse number 1 with me. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the, say it with me, Chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not what? Away, amen. So we see the third title given, the chief shepherd. And it's very interesting that the placement of each one of these, the first one mentioned in the New Testament is the good shepherd. The second one mentioned in the New Testament is the great shepherd. And the third one is the chief shepherd. And so as we look at this, turn back over to Psalm chapter number 22. Psalm chapter number 22, 23, and 24 are a group psalm. These three psalms go together, and they are also in the proper order. In Psalm chapter number 22, we see uh, the, the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep. And so in Psalm chapter number two is a description of the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep. Are you with me? In Psalm chapter number 23, really kind of the end of chapter number 22 and into chapter and all of chapter number 23, it talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And so we see in this passage, we see that that great shepherd here is in this passage passage guiding his sheep. He is that great shepherd, as we mentioned in Hebrews, that is risen from the dead. I read the following verse in chapter number 13 after the great shepherd because it talks about how that he would make us perfect in every good work and in his work. Where's his good work that we're doing right here on this earth? So we see, we see his dealing as the good shepherd paying for our sins, dying for us, giving his life for us. We see the great shepherd as that shepherd that now is risen from the dead. That's a great thing. Amen. And then he also guides and directs us in our day-to-day life in this wicked world. And then we see the chief shepherd, as mentioned in Peter, it mentioned there when he comes again. And when it talks about Jesus coming again, it is talking about the second advent of Christ. It is not talking about the rapture because he's not literally coming down to this earth. That's the rapture of the church. But that second advent, when he comes back to this earth, that's the chief uh, uh, shepherd, that king of kings and lord of lords that's going to conquer the nations of the world and then rule and reign with an iron fist, the Bible says, in the millennial reign of Christ. And so we see Psalm chapter number two, the good shepherd. Psalm chapter number 3, 23, the great shepherd. And Psalm chapter number 24, the chief shepherd. Amen. And so we're going to be looking at the good shepherd. The title of the message is the good shepherd, part number one of uh, part 31. Amen. 31 parts. And so anyways, as we look at this, we see in this passage in the early chapters of the book of Leviticus, let me give you something else that's good. Uh, We read of five different offerings. One is the meal or meat offering, which is the only one of the five that requires no sacrifice. It's a meal or meat offering. And actually, I think if you look at chapter number 16 of the Psalms, it's a representation of the meal or the meat offering, which Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry 
perfectly fulfilled. And so, and then there are four others that require a sacrifice. There's the burnt offering, the peace offering, and the trespass offering. And we see those three. We see the burnt offering in Psalm chapter number 40, the peace offering in Psalm chapter number 85, and the trespass offering in Psalm chapter number 69. If you want that information, I think it's good information to have. And then that other, the fourth offering was sin offering. And we see that right here in Psalm chapter number 22. He was the offering of sin. It is the sin offering we see we have the Lord Christ being made sin for us. And we see some of the great details that you don't see other places in the Bible of his time on that cross dying for our sins. The really, uh, a lot of the emotional side of things that you don't really get a full picture of when you look in the Gospels. And some people have called Psalm 22 the fifth gospel, as a matter of fact. And so just some information. And so anyways, as we look at this and we see this, this matter of the sin offering, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be what? Sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now listen, here we go. We're jumping in. Jesus is the perfect example of how to handle suffering. Jesus is is the perfect example of how to handle extreme suffering. Notice with me the amazing lessons that we can learn from our suffering Savior. And so will you learn from, the, uh, from and follow our Lord's example in times of extreme suffering? Verse number one, look at that with me. We'll look at the first uh, four words. My God, my God. As we stop and we look at that, we know that it's roughly about a thousand years later that Jesus says those same exact words on the cross of Calvary. Go over to Matthew. Let's look at each one of those verses. Each one of those verses. Matthew chapter number 27 with me, please. Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter number 27 in your Bibles, our suffering Savior and the lessons that we can learn from him. My God, my God. And the thing I want you to notice about this is, is I want you to see our Savior's faith. Our Savior's faith as he is on the cross. We look at this and we see in Matthew chapter number 27, look at verse number 46 with me, verse number 46 of our text. Verse number 46, the Bible says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, what that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we look at Psalm chapter number 22 is an exact quote of what Jesus said. And it was a thousand years later. Now we know that the Psalms uh, are, are this, especially Psalm 22 was written by David. And David wrote as a result of what he was dealing with and what he was going through in his life. Now we don't know an exact time of when Psalm 22 was written in his life. We don't know what he was going through. We do know that a couple of the most extreme things that happened in his life was one, one, when he was running from King Saul, and two is when he was running from his own son, Absalom. And so we, it's possible that it could have been those times, but as we look at this, I wonder sometimes if it is possible, and this is my own personal opinion, if it is possible when he escaped into the land of the Philistines. And the reason I wonder that is because he had gotten in despair thinking that I surely will die at the hands of Saul one day. He was probably at the lowest in his life at this point in time that he would literally escape into the enemy's hands and go into their land. That must have been one of the lowest times of his life where he had actually, what appears to be, had lost faith in the Lord and fled into the enemy's land and took off instead of continuing to trust God. And as a result of that, you know, the story he ended up having some bad things happen. His own men almost killed him because of the loss of their families and their things. And so anyways, but the Lord delivered him out of all that. And so we see in this passage, God is always faithful. Amen. And so as we look at this, the first thing I want you to notice, our Savior's faith. So we see in this passage, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He says, my God, my God. All the time that Jesus was on the cross, all the time that we're going to look at where he is completely separated from God the Father. Hey, listen, as, as a person... 
when, when our body gets separated from another part of our being, that's a pretty dramatic thing. Would you not, like when we physically die and our spirit and our soul is separated from our body, that's a pretty dramatic moment in our life. Would you, would you admit that, amen? And this is a dramatic moment for the Lord Jesus Christ because while he is on the cross, God the Father literally separates himself from his son. And he cries out, my God, my God. He never loses faith in God the Father. I know that he's God, but he, at this point in time, is 100% man, yet still having the attributes of God. But he dealt with all the pain, all the suffering, all the physical part of it, but not only that, the emotional part of it, not only that, all of the spiritual part of it, which was really the worst part of it. Go over to Mark chapter number 15 with me. Let's look at another parallel verse. Mark chapter number 15. And and I'm taking this somewhere. I'm just taking the scenic route. Mark chapter number 15. Look at verse number 34 with me. The other parallel passage. Mark chapter number 15, verse number 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so we see in this passage, these two passages, he cries out, he does not lose his faith. L, that E-L at the beginning of Eli, Eli, that word literally means strength. And that is a title of God. Now, I know I've bumped this verse one other time before, but turn over to 1 Samuel chapter number 15. I want you to see this. I want you to see this is an awesome thing right here. 1 Samuel chapter number 15. It's amazing how things tie together. I love this, and I'm going to be tracing a little trail here. It's kind of like a rabbit trail, but it was intentional. It's actually in my notes. And so, hallelujah, amen. Normally, rabbit trails are never in my notes. And so, 1 Samuel... Chapter number 15 with me, 1 Samuel chapter number 15. If you're there, wait for me to catch up. 1 Samuel chapter number 15, if you would please, look at verse number 28 with me. Verse number 28. 1 Samuel 15, verse number 28. If you're there, say amen. Amen. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also, look at that word right there. What's it say? Strength of Israel. Notice that it is capitalized with an S. And it says, Strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. And it goes on to label that strength as he. Amen? He, God, strength. And so when you talk to God, strength, I really need you today. Can I get a witness? That's a proper name for the Lord. And so when you talk to God, his name is strength. One of the names that he has, L, means strength. This is a title of God. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter number 29. I want you to see this. 1 Samuel chapter number 29. This is good. This is another portion of the rabbit trail. I I saw that, and then it how it got to this thought in my mind, I don't know, but it did, amen? And so 1 Samuel chapter number 29, verse number 3, we're actually in the passage where he runs off into Gath, and he's uh, with the the kings of the Philistines. He's getting ready to have to go to battle against his own people uh, with the Philistines, David and his men. He's getting ready to have to go to battle with them, and the princes of the Philistines gather around, and they talk to the king of the Philistines, and say, this is David. He's the guy that's killed a bunch of us. This is the guy that is, and, and this king is trying to defend him and wants him to go to battle because he's such a great warrior. And his men are great warriors. And so look at verse number three. Then said the princes of the Philistines, what do these Hebrews hear? And Ashish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days and these what? Years. His trip to Gath, or Ziklag, his trip to Ziklag was not just a, a blink. Years. 
I think sometimes we think he shows up there and he just is there for a little bit, ends up going to have to go to bed. He was there for years. Look at this now. Just a little nugget. I love nuggets. You like nuggets? Nuggets are good. Chicken nuggets. Hallelujah. And so anyways, moving along before I digress any further. Which hath been with me these days or these years, and I have found no fault in him. I have found no what? Fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. And so when we stop and we look at this, David is such an amazing picture of Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a foreshadow of things to come, so to speak, as, as you would, would call it in theology, a foreshadow of things to come. Psalm 22 was a foreshadow of things to come. It was prophetic of what would happen to Jesus Christ on the cross and such a, an amazing picture of crucifixion on a cross in a day when it hadn't even been invented yet. It's an incredible thing. This is a thousand years, roughly a thousand years earlier. And so we see that shadow. We see that word where he cries out, Eli, Eli, meaning strength. And that is a title of God. He has faith in God. And then we see in this passage when David is there, a pagan king, an ungodly, worldly king, a Gentile king, calls him, says that he finds no fault in him. You're pushing him away and there's no fault in him. Go to John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19. We're going to get back to Psalm 22 shortly. John chapter number 19. And we see where Jesus is also, there's so many prophecies that are fulfilled, little, just little blinks. Just little passages that are fulfilled from this. Psalm chapter number 19, look at it with me. Verse number 6. When the, priest, the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out saying, what? Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, take ye him and crucify him. For I find no fault in him. It is worded exactly the same. I find no fault in him. So they both had a king say to them, a pagan lost king say to them, that, or about them, that they found no fault in him. Now turn over to 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2 in your Bibles. Our Savior's faith. He never lost faith in God the Father, while he was on the cross. While he was going through the most excruciating moment, the most horrifying moment of his, I should say his eternity, because he's eternal. Are you with me? The, 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 really, the very thing that defines Jesus Christ was the death on the cross. And you say, you think that? Well, I thought it was the resurrection. I don't know. I definitely think as we as Christians, but what does the world glorify? Where do you see Jesus at all the time on statues and everything? On a cross. It's what the world has defined him by. Are you with me? And so as we look at this and we see in this passage, 1 Peter chapter number 2 with me, please. I want you to see this. This is good. Verse number 18 Servants, be subject to your masters with all what? Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering what? Wrongfully. Jesus suffered wrongfully. He did nothing to deserve the death on the cross. Who did no sin, oh, wait a minute, back it up, where was I? Suffering wrong, oh, verse number 20. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with who? Now, this is what's acceptable with God. As a child of God, 
if we're going to be like Jesus, we should experience as we live and walk for Christ, we should suffer wrongly. We should be falsely accused as he was falsely accused. We should be falsely persecuted and unjustly persecuted as he was unjustly persecuted. Can I get a witness? And so we see in this passage our Savior's faith. And so my, my point is this. Too many times in Christians' lives, when the trouble comes, when the persecution, the trial, whatever it is, the issue, the problem, the health problem, all of a sudden... We lose faith in God. We begin to feel sorry for ourselves. And instead of trusting God and crying out to God, my God, my God. And, it, and believing that God does hear and does care. Even in the worst of the situation in our lives. Whatever the worst day of your life has ever been or may still be to come. Trust God. In the most climatic point of Christ's earthly life, as he was dying for our sins on the cross, falsely accused, called names, spit upon, smote in the face, beard plucked, body ravaged with a scourge. Yet he never lost faith. And he never quit in the midst of the torture. He could have. He had the means to. And stop and think about this. Sometimes when we're in the middle of a battle, it's not about us. As a matter of fact, most of the time it's not about us at all. It's about those around us. Because Jesus went through the entire suffering until his death when he gave up the spirit, when he gave up the ghost, as the Bible says. Listen, it wasn't about him. It was for us. And he had the ability to stop it. And sometimes, listen to me, just because you have a way out of suffering, does not mean that's God's will. I'm not saying it's not. Because sometimes makes it available for us so that we can get out of that suffering or get out of that trial or get out of that persecution. But sometimes it's not God's will. Sometimes God wants you to stay right there and handle it as a Christian so that others can see Christ develop in you. Amen? While he was on the cross, he never, he never said a bad word. He never falsely accused his persecutors. He never spoke ill of them. He said seven things, seven statements on the cross. And every one of them was perfectly acceptable in the most worst of torments and struggles. And man, it's amazing how quick we'll defend ourselves. Amen? But that is not Christ-like. And that does not please the Lord. Our Savior's faith. We see in this passage, let's continue to read verse number 21. For even hereunto were ye called. Called to what? To suffer without it being your fault. Because that's what's acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for what? Us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did know what? Neither were guile found in his what? Is that not what I just explained? Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth what? Righteously. And that is what we are supposed to do. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto what? 
righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Can I get a witness? And that this is a great passage right here too. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Can I get a witness right there? And so, yes, I'm your pastor if you're a member of Solid Rock Baptist Church, but you've got a much better pastor, bishop, in heaven. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. Hallelujah. And so as we look at this and we see in this passage, we see our Savior's faith, all that he dealt with, all that he went through, all of the beating and all of these, he maintained faith in God the Father. And as we face persecution, suffering, health problems, all of these different things, and there are so many things that we suffer. Are there not? It always amazes me. I think I've, you know, I've heard all kinds of different diseases and stuff like that, and then I'll hear of something new. There are so many things that can go wrong with your body. It is amazing. It is mind-baffling how many diseases there are out there. Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. Amen? And so anyways, listen, as we look at this and we see in this passage, I mean, you're talking about suffering in all of these different ways. But I not only want you to see in Psalm chapter number 22, I don't want you to just see his faith, but I also want you to see his feelings, our Savior's feelings. Look at verse number one of Psalm chapter number 22 with me once again. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Can I get a witness? And so as we look at this, we see he had feelings about this matter. In the midst of his suffering, when God the Father completely separated himself from God the Son and divided his being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are you with me? There was an actual parting of that, just as our body being separated from our soul and our spirit is a dramatic thing. This was a very dramatic thing, the feelings of separation. It's a very big contrast. Go to John with me. You, you've got to understand that Jesus, it, it kind of reminds me of, of Sam and Donovan, and, and they're together all the time. Has he ever been anywhere? Well, uh, no, there was one time where she wasn't allowed because she had just gotten over COVID and she wasn't allowed to take him into the doctor. He had to do it. Never again. Never again. <laughs> and you know what happened? He's trying to juggle. I've I seen the picture, amen. And, and the FaceTime at the same time, the whole time they went into the office so she could hear what the doctor said. Because truth be known, we men don't listen near as well as a, as a lady does. And so anyways... Yes, you can pay me later, ladies. And so anyways, and, and uh, as we look at this, feelings of separation. Go to John chapter number 16. John chapter number 16. I want you to see this. And so and it really reminds me of, of the fact that, and, and, and it really is with Donovan having been with Samantha all the time, her son. When there's a separation there, Donovan's like, I see Mrs. Frost taking him down the hall. And Corey and Sam are up here. And when I got back there, he's like, what in the world? Do you see what I'm saying? It was probably pretty dramatic for him, the little guy. Are, are you understanding what I'm saying? We're talking about God the Son and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit have never in all of eternity ever been apart until Jesus was on the cross. Are you with me? That is so, such a, such dramatic and very, just, it must have been almost to the point of unbearable. Praise the Lord, he was God. If you stop and think about this, this had to be some, I mean, somebody you've been with your entire life. And then there's that separation. That's difficult. And honestly, none of us as adults in here can even begin to understand that. Maybe someday God will help us to understand a little better when we're in heaven. Because none of us since the time we were born until present day has been with a person every single day of their life together without any separation whatsoever. 
stop and think about that. And so this feeling of separation, look at John chapter number 16. We see a little bit of, of his explanation of this. John chapter number 16, look at verse number 31 when you get there. It's the end of the, cha uh, yeah, end of the chapter, verse number 31. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me, what? Alone. And yes, he was alone. There was nobody with him on the cross. He was absolutely 100% alone. And people don't seem to understand when they go to hell, if they don't accept Jesus Christ, they will be utterly, 100% alone. It's going to be horrific. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, and now is, and come to see every man of his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not, what? Alone. Because the Father is, what? With me. The Father is is with me. Are you with me? These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He just said, you're going to have tribulation in the world. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to have tribulation. We are going to suffer. It's what we have been called to as Christians. That is the simple truth of our Christianity. Thank God for church, amen? Thank God where we can get away from the world and come together and fellowship together. Thank God for a Christian home. Thank God it's a place of safety from the world. Praise God for all of those things, amen? And so as we look at this, we see this feelings of separation, but also feelings of silence. Go back to Psalm 22. Psalm chapter number 22 I stop and I think about people who have lost their spouses and how after, you know, I think about folks that have been married for many, many, many years and then one of them dies and how dreadfully alone they must feel. It's got to be so dramatic. Feelings of silence. Look at Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from what? And from the words of my what? Roaring. In his feelings, he felt utterly alone. Now we know that Jesus himself, which I believe in John chapter number 16, when he said, the Father will be with me. He was talking about when he was suffering on the cross through that whole thing. He was separated, but he still recognized that even though there was that separation, that God was still, in a sense, in his corner, even though they were separated. He will be with me. He was confident, and he said, my God, my God. And so as we look at this, and from the words of my roaring, and so this is the way he is feeling. He's, he's giving us a picture of not necessarily reality, but what it was like to be on the cross, it felt utterly alone. It was like somebody who had nothing but known light, and all of a sudden, complete darkness. They say, I can't remember what cave it is, but they, they, when they go down into these caves and they get down into this complete away from any possible light, and they kill the headlamps. And they say the darkness is so dark, there's literally no light whatsoever, no movement. You can't see your hand do this in front of your face. It is absolute pitch blackness. And they say people will begin to panic after a certain amount of time if the lights do not come back on because of the, the, the eeriness of just that darkness. And I wonder if 
that is what the Lord was experiencing as he that was the light of the world became sin for us who knew no sin. It must have been like turning the light off. And so as we look at this and see this, the feelings of silence, go to John chapter number 11 with me. John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11. <clears throat> John chapter number 11. Look at verse number 41 and 42. We're almost there. I'm on the last page. John chapter number 11. Verses 41 and 42. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast what? Past tense. And I knew that thou hearest me what? Future tense. He always hears. And since he's talking to the Father right then, present tense. Are you with me? But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast what? Sent me. And then the famous words, and then he spoke, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, I heard a preacher say one time, if he'd have just said, come forth, everybody that was dead would have came forth. Amen. Hallelujah. Phew, that would have been exciting. And so, Amen. Can you imagine how many people there were in all of creation at that time up to that point? And so anyways, and uh, I, I wonder if all the animals and everything that died would have came forth. That would have been something, huh? Yeah. <laughs> sure would have been. But man, it would have been open season, amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, they would have died instantly because there's not enough oxygen. And they would have suffocated right then and there. And so anyways, that's what happened to the dinosaurs. The oxygen level dropped by like three times because before the flood, there was a canopy of water over the earth which raised the oxygen level, which is a greenhouse effect. Anyways, that is totally off track. But anyways, <laughs> feelings of silence. And so he hears him always. And so I believe that's even on the cross. Even though he turned his back on him, was not able to look on that sin, was not able to, to, to be a part of that. But no doubt, just like the truth of the matter is, is God the Father hears the cries of lost sinners before they're saved. Can I get a witness? And so as we look at this, we see this. And so we see this experience. Even though he was crying, it's like, you're not even hearing me. My, 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 my cry is falling on deaf ears. No, not really. And so anyways, as we look at this, go to Ephesians chapter number 5 with me. Ephesians chapter number 5. I want you to see this. This is good. And then we'll look at our last point. And I'll tie it all together. Ephesians chapter number 5. Verse number 1 and 2. Be therefore followers of who? As dear children. And walk in what? As Christ also hath loved us and hath done what? Given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And so as we look at this, we see this matter that we're to walk as he walked. This matter of suffering, this matter of, of his feelings and being separated in silence. Listen, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is I always find it something's wrong with a Christian if they always have to have something playing, some noise. They can't handle being in silence. If there's always got to be a radio, if there's always got to be a TV, if there's always got to be something playing in the background, because what I find is, is there's something wrong with their relationship with God? And you say, why is that? Because when it gets quiet, that's when God begins to communicate. What did he say to Elijah? That still, small voice. You know, I always think about one of my relatives and living a very wicked lifestyle and always have to be going somewhere, always got to be doing 
something always has to have music going or a TV going or something along those lines because they're trying to silence the voice of God in their life. And I know that that voice is there. You say, how do you know? Because I pray that it is. And God hears and answers prayers. Can I get a witness? And so this matter of, of hearing, this listening. And so Jesus, while he was his feelings of separation, his feelings of silence, but also not only do we see the Savior's faith and the Savior's feelings, but we also see the Savior's fear. Turn over to Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews chapter number 5. And I'm going to tie all this together. You're going to get it. Hebrews chapter number 5. The Savior's fear. Jesus wasn't afraid of anything. Actually, he was. Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 5. When you get there, say amen. amen. Look at what it says. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of what? Melchizedek, who is the days of who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from what? And was heard. In that he what? He feared. And being made, or wait a minute, though he were a what? Do you see the capital S? This is speaking of Jesus. Yet learned he obedience by the things which he what? Suffered. Stop and chew on that for a while. One, he was afraid. He feared this. Two, he had to learn obedience. He was God. He didn't have to obey anybody until God the Son had to obey God the Father and do His will. Well, you say, not my will, but thine be done. He learned obedience at that point. Being God, He never had to obey anybody. Are you with me? Until it came to this point. Now look at this, good. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal what? Unto all them that what? Obey him. <laughs> That's good stuff. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Do you say, was Melchizedek the high priest in the Old Testament? Was it the Holy Spirit or was it Jesus? It's both. And so anyways, moving along because there's always a debate amongst us fundamentally independent Baptists because the Holy Spirit is pointed out as being Melchizedek and so is Jesus. And so as we look at this, I think it's both. I think it's a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ and I think it was also the Holy Spirit as well. And so anyways, moving along. You say, how does that work? We'll figure it out when we get to heaven. And so anyways, he suffered for sins he did not commit. He paid a price he did not owe. Go to Hebrews chapter number four with me. Hebrews chapter number four, you should be right there. Hebrews chapter number four, look at verse number 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our what? Profession. Profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our what? But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without what? Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sins. He knows the feelings of our every part. He's been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus dealt with every single feeling of infirmity you've ever dealt with. You say, well, I've been forsaken by, so was he. Every one of his disciples fled. Are you with me? 
There was a point in time where his, his mother and his brethren and John mocking him. Are you with me? I mean, the, the entire thing. He's, he's had family issues. He had friend issues. He had obvious national issues. He had issues with his own nation, his own people, his own race. Racism, he dealt with it. Jesus was persecuted. Jesus, hey, physical, he dealt with it. Everything. There's not a person on the earth that felt more pain than that man felt when he was on the cross. What he suffered. And not only that, something you have never felt up to this point. And if you're saved in here, say amen. You never will. Is the flames of hell. Your soul will never spend any time in that awful place as his did. And so as we look at this, we see this. You can't leave somebody someplace they haven't been, amen? In two different times in the Bible, Old Testament prophecy for fi repeated in Acts chapter number 2, I will not leave thy soul in hell. Can I get a witness? Jesus did spend three days and three nights in hell. His soul did. His spirit spent three days and three nights in paradise. And his body spent three days and three nights in a new tomb. It was only new after the first second after he was in there. And so anyways, are you with me? Because he occupied it. That made it not new anymore. And so anyways, look at this now. We see in this passage, he felt everything we felt. Our Savior's faith. Our Savior's feelings. And our Savior's fear. It's not wrong to fear. But it's wrong to allow fear to rule in your life. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. That doesn't mean we won't experience fear, but we should not allow, we should not succumb to fear as he didn't. Did he go to the cross or didn't he? Did he die? Yes, he did. He faced all of those fears and went on. Fear is not sin. It's succumbing to the fear that is sin. He never did. Hey, listen, these feelings, these pains, these physical problems, these emotional problems, all of these things, he faced every bit of it, and yet without sin. He never had a bit of sin. He dealt every part of it. He went through everything that you can ever imagine going through. He does know what we're going through, and you can count on him. Even while being made sin for us, our Savior maintained his faith in the Father. Yes, he experienced the same feelings of being alone and feelings of being ignored. Yes, he also experienced fear. Yet in all of this, he sinned not. He is a worthy example for us to follow and pattern our suffering after. And you can. Because the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me which strengtheneth me. It's very important that we don't mix that up because it's the doing of things through Christ that gives us the strength. Can I get a witness? Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He didn't lose faith in the Father. And you can live by His faith. Who loved me and gave Himself for me. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Suffering. He's the good shepherd, amen. He gave His life for the sheep. Psalm chapter number 22 is about the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep. It is about that sin offering where he literally became sin for us. He faced these feelings. He faced the fears. He faced those things. Don't let your feelings rule your decisions. Let your faith in Christ rule your decisions. Let your, your, your faith 
rule your decisions. Let your faith rule over your fear. Don't let your fear rule. Because if your feelings or your fear ever take control and you begin to make your decisions based on those, oh, it'll end bad. Let your faith be what makes your decisions. Every head bowed, every back closed. No one looking around. If you know 100% for sure you're saved, you slip your hand up. God sees those hands. You can put them down. Child of God, suffer like Jesus suffered. Maintain your faith. Don't allow your feelings and your fear be your decision makers. Trust the Lord. Stay faithful and allow Him to work. If God spoke to your heart tonight, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven? God sees those hands all over the place. The piano's playing. If you need to come, you come on. Now's the time. Come talk to the Lord. Let, let's do business tonight. Let God have His way. Our Savior's faith. He didn't allow His feelings to get Him off that cross. He didn't allow his fears to stop him from going to the cross. And this is the example that we're supposed to follow. This is what we're called to. Suffering. Persecution. It is the will of God for our lives. So often we want to escape those things and we'll try to find ways out of those things. But sometimes it is the perfect will of God for us to suffer. And as we handle our suffering as a child of God and we exercise our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the mighty power of a holy God will step in and do so much more than you could ever imagine. Let's sing a couple of verses, brother.